Dobry wieczór. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Alicja Krawczyn-Rygmaczewska from the Polonian Foundation team. Um, and uh, I have the privilege of hosting today, today's Career Cafe meeting. Uh, the Career Cafe is a cycle of, um, uh, it's a series of uh, monthly events where we meet to share and learn more practical side of the researcher's life. Uh, we launched this project in November and we are very happy with how it's been developing so far. So we hope you will enjoy this meeting as well. There we go. Um, so the project was organized by the Polonium Network, a platform created by the Polonium Foundation. And we are a non-profit organization recruiting and connecting Polish researchers, both in the country and abroad. And by organizing conferences, workshops, discussion panels, or projects like the Career Cafe, we facilitate the exchange of experiences, ideas, uh, scientific collaborations, and um, presenting different parts of the scientific career, both in Poland and abroad. As you can see, our members come from all sorts of fields and career stages, and we are also spread out across the world, which makes our events even more enriching and fascinating. Um, we are strongly encouraging everyone uh, interested and anyone who, who hasn't done it so far to register with the Polonium Network. The registration is free. And if you activate this, your profile, you will have access to our database of other like-minded researchers. The job offer engine, which is currently holding 18 job offers. So make sure to check that out. It's definitely worth it. And a first-hand info about events like this one. Uh, today's meeting will be divided into three parts, so after this quick introduction, you will hear our panelists' presentations and we will finish with a moderated discussion part. Uh, so if you have any questions for the panelists, uh, you can put them in the, in the chat and I will either call you out when it's time or read your question um, to ask to the panelists. So uh, on that note, I would like to introduce the panelists we are meeting with uh, with today. Um, so give a warm warm online welcome to Richard Austulewicz from the European Neuroscience Institute Göttingen, a joint initiative of the University Medical Center Göttingen and the Max Planck Society. Alexandra Kurowska, a visiting student bioscience, bioscience program, biological and environmental science and engineering at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Krzysztof Kozak from the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute at Gamba, Panama. Karol Mazanowski from the Department of Marine Plankton Research at the Institute of Oceanography at the University of Gdańsk, Poland. And Isabella Stachowicz, an assistant professor from the Department of Biodiversity Studies and Bioeducation at the University of Łódź, Poland, and a postdoctoral fellow in Ecology Center Instituto Venezolano de Investigaciones Scientificas at Venezuela. So again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will get to them later. And for now, I will stop my screen sharing. And uh, Richard, we can start with you, uh, will share his story with everyone. So Richard, the floor is yours. Sorry, one, just one second. Okay, <clears throat> so is the slide working now? Great, um, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, so my name is Richard. I'm currently based at the European Neuroscience Institute in Göttingen, Germany. And it's a real pleasure to uh, be here today and to tell you a few things um, about my academic trajectory so far. So I've been an academic nomad for the last 15 years or so. I started as a student of psychology and philosophy um, back in Poland, quite close to where I was from, so in Poznań. Um, and at the time, I was already interested in how the mind works. And I thought that psychology and philosophy have all the answers. But quite early on, I also realized that there is this thing called the brain that I also need to learn quite a lot about. Um, and at the time, Polish neuroscience research wasn't as developed as it is now. 
Uh, so I decided it would be a good idea to move uh, abroad for my education. So I first moved to uh, Amsterdam and um, I learned a lot of the technical aspects of doing research in neuroscience. So I learned a lot about brain imaging techniques. Uh, but I also usually when I go to another, I decide on a new place, I try to decide also based on some other non-academic factors. And in this case, um, I said Amsterdam would be a great destination because it's uh, a really open, uh, diverse, tolerant uh, city. And so this is what uh, was perhaps a bit different from Poznan at the time and perhaps even uh, now. And maybe one anecdote I can share with you was uh, that already on the first day, as soon as I arrived at the university and I was about to sign my uh, paperwork, as soon as I signed this paperwork, the admissions officer offered this uh, big celebratory joint, <laughs> which was maybe not the most um, kind of uh, everyday experience, but it was nevertheless like a fun introduction to academic um, culture in the Netherlands. So anyway, uh, I moved on to do a PhD in Berlin um, and I chose Berlin because it had this really great PhD program where it was very flexible so I could really design my uh, PhD projects from A to Z and um, uh, it was also quite quick so I could basically relatively quickly gain a level of um, intellectual uh, independence and go uh, a few steps further in this uh, typical academic pathway. Uh, so I learned quite a lot about uh, things like data analysis of, of neuroscience data, but I also really enjoyed my time in general as a PhD student. Um, I think Germany in general has a very uh, good work-life balance, uh, so I really had a great time. And actually, based on that experience, I, uh, I still call Berlin my home now, so I'm actually now physically based uh, in Berlin. Um, after a few adventures. So the first adventure was that I uh, started my postdoc uh, phase in London. And uh, I, there I had this opportunity to work with one of the most uh, influential and highly cited uh, neuroscientists, Professor Carl Friston, who is the uh, author of this uh, really influential theory of brain function called the free energy principle or the predictive coding framework. It's quite a complex mathematical theory. So uh, under his mentorship, I learned a lot in general, but specifically a lot about mathematical modeling of the brain. Um, um, and I still use that period as a source of sort of inspiration for my work now. Uh, but at the same time, I have to say that it was um, quite challenging, uh, partly maybe because it was quite far away outside of my comfort zone, um, but partly because I found UCL specifically in my area, maybe, but it was really competitive, uh, maybe more competitive than uh, uh, how I would have liked it. Um, so for the next step, I chose Oxford, which was an excellent uh, decision. Uh, so I um, ended up in a very collaborative uh, environment. Uh, so at the same time, you know, there was a lot of intellectual um, input and rigor. Uh, but the vibe was much more sort of open and uh, collaborative and uh, friendly. Uh, so I really, really enjoyed my time in Oxford. And uh, I think some of my favorite papers um, are actually from that time. So let me just give you a one minute introduction into what I actually do. Uh, so I'm interested in how the brain implements perception. Uh, and according to very traditional views, um, the brain is like an input output machine. So basically whatever comes to our senses, like our eyes or our ears, is processed in this hierarchy of brain regions uh, from some early sensory regions to higher order prefrontal regions. And so basically this process is thought to be very sort of feed forward or bottom up. And um, there is some role of top down connections from higher to lower regions. Um, but the, the role of this feedback, you know, it might be limited to things like stabilizing, processing, or maybe refining it a bit, but there's not much more than that. But even based on our everyday experience, we know that it's not the, the whole story. So our perception doesn't only rely on sense sensations on what is actually happening in the world, but also on our interpretations of what is happening. So for example, if you uh, encountered this scene a few years ago before the pandemic, probably what, you've, what you would actually focused on would be this person on the right wearing a mask because back then probably it wasn't something that you would have predicted on public transport. 
Um, but in 2022, depending on where you live, but maybe what would actually pop out more is the person on the left not wearing a mask. So this is probably what your person so much thought to be like an input output machine, but more um, an actual prediction machine. So it's uh, thought to generate this model of the world and the model contains some predictions of what is likely to happen. And these predictions are sent in a top-down way from higher to lower regions. And at each stage, they are compared with what is either actually happening or what is processed by lower order brain regions. So the result of this comparison between predictions and inputs is called a prediction error. And these prediction errors are propagated in a bottom-up way uh, back up the hierarchy. So this theory has become really influential and a lot of people have suggested that it's like a general principle of brain function and that it's very automatic and it appears in all contexts and all kinds of brain regions and so on. But actually what my work has uh, contributed to is to revise this theory. So what I have shown uh, together with my colleagues is that, for example, predictive coding, predictive processing is very strongly modulated by other factors, for example, by attention or by contextual probability. So for example, what is relevant for you in a given context. What I've also shown is that different kinds of predictions, for example, predictions of what is likely to happen and when it is likely to happen, are implemented as completely different brain mechanisms in different brain regions and using different neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. And what I'm working on now is to uh, uh, integrate this theory with um, other theories of memory processing. So basically what I'm working on is to understand how different brain regions that process sensory information, how they are modulated by simultaneous encoding of predictions of what is likely to happen next and of memories, so of what just happened before. So these ideas are based on my previous work on uh, human volunteers, but also on some computational models. Uh, but I thought it would be really important to actually test them more directly. So for uh, my next step, um, I wanted to uh, go into animal models. And so I found this uh, group headed by uh, Professor Jan Schnupp, uh, who uh, uh, had recently relocated from Oxford to Hong Kong. And um, I decided to apply for this EU grant to join him in Hong Kong, and I spent the last uh, few years there. And uh, I ended up actually co-directing a lab together with him. Uh, the lab was uh, consisted of around 12 people. And together, we really understood much more about the brain mechanisms of predictive processing, not only at this macro scale, so interactions between different brain regions, but also at lower scales of investig uh, investigations, for example, different brain cells. So let me just show you some impressions from Hong Kong. So these are some photos I took there. You might think, you know, Hong Kong is a huge city, skyscrapers and so on, but actually this is true, but it wasn't the case of my everyday <laughs> uh, experience there. So I actually lived on a small island called Lama. Uh, it's an island with no skyscrapers and no cars even, but just uh, some villages and, a, and some jungles and, and beaches. And so every day I had to take this ferry to work, um, cross the harbor, and uh, sometimes I would take these photos. Actually, sometimes I would see this boat with what looked like a Polish flag. I'm not still, it's a mystery to me what, what, what this boat was doing there. Um, but yeah, Hong Kong is full of amazing natural spots. So in my free time, I would do a lot of hiking and swimming and so on. Um, sometimes nature would kind of uh, creep into the lab or into the office. Uh, so sometimes in the morning, I would find geckos on my desk or there would be lots of typhoons, so sometimes I wouldn't be able to go to the office. Or uh, after work, we would go swimming in, the, in these waterfalls. So this is uh, here my colleague for scale at the bottom of the photo. Um, uh, also, Hong Kong is just next to the mainland China, so we would go there quite a lot with my colleagues. So on the top, you can see some photos from Guilin in uh, the Guangxi province. And at the bottom, you just see a few of my colleagues. So as you can see, it was a very, very international uh, research environment. I think out of 12 people, we had around 10 uh, nationalities and five continents represented. So really very diverse. I also um, tried to kind of represent my <laughs> culture sometimes. So on this occasion, this was uh, you know one of the fun non-academic things that I did. Um, was uh, to cook Polish uh, vegetarian food for like, I don't know, 120 people or so uh, for a Chinese New Year celebration at this uh, cafe. 
which was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, one of my guilty pleasures was to spot kind of things that were lost in translation. So, uh, for example, uh, badly translated uh, English on people's um, fashion items or badly translated English on food menus. So here, for example, Google suggests to have a wild bacteria steak or um, asthma beef rice. Um, but yeah, not, not everything was as entertaining, obviously. So as you probably have heard, Hong Kong has experienced these huge um, uh, social and political changes in the last couple of years. And I also witnessed that, for example, these demonstrations for uh, up to 2 million people, um, so around a quarter of the population. And we also experienced uh, COVID probably before uh, most of you guys did. And again, maybe this is an example of a perceptual error, but people really do treat it differently there, maybe based on their experience with SARS. Um, but yeah, based on all of these you know, adventures, um, I thought it was time to go back. Um, and also actually this was part of my uh, grant to be reintegrated back into Europe. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a, a few months ago, uh, or a year ago now, I moved back to Germany, and now I'm based in Göttingen, which is like a, a bit of an Oxford of Germany, so a uh, small but very nice academic town, and I'm currently applied for, I'm currently applying for slightly more permanent positions, hopefully, uh, so Germany is good for work and life balance, but not so good for bureaucracy, so there's a lot of application forms that I have to fill, fill out these days. Um, but hopefully something nice will um, happen out of that. Uh, so with that, I would like to just highlight my collaborators and uh, advisors and students. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your talk, Richard. It was very fascinating. Uh, so I think we can move on to the next person and then we'll ask questions. Uh, to all of you later. Uh, so, Alexandra, the, the floor is yours now. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation for this event. So, uh, let me tell you my experience um, in Saudi Arabia as a, a student, as a participant of a visiting student research program. Uh, so, uh, Oh, sorry. Okay, can you see the next slide? Yep. Yes. yes. Uh, good. So a little bit about my story. Um, so basically, I started um, try, uh, traveling for scientific purposes after my bachelor degree. And uh, I uh, obtained my master degree in applied genetics in Georgia. After which I moved to, uh, to after that I moved to Switzerland for a one year long internship. And um, in October 2021, I moved um, to, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, so currently I'm conducting an internship in bioinformatics at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. And uh, my, my focus, uh, my, my work mainly focuses on uh, chromosome confirmation data analysis, uh, which gives us insight onto spatial organization of DNA in a cell. Um, and that's uh, we can gain more uh, information of biological functions and uh, gene regulatory mechanisms. So uh, that's shortly about my work. And um, uh, this is the university, how it looks like uh, by night. And in university, we have three main um, scientific uh, divisions uh, that students can um, uh, can work on and uh, do their projects. Uh, and um, one of, um, um, like, it's, it's a, I think it's a really good university and it provides uh, many uh, core labs that facilitate health facilities research for students. And uh, for example, we have one of the fastest supercomputers in the world uh, called Shaheen. Um, and this is how our office looks like. So uh, we have a kind of open space type of office and on every floor, um, every team, every group has its own space. And um, uh, next to our desks uh, on one side, we have more common space, a common chair area. And on the other side here behind um, 
the glasses, we have um, labs uh, to conduct um, different sort of experiments. Um, this is for, uh, for the people working in the wet lab. Uh, and uh, uh, one thing that I particularly like about this university is the fact that it um, takes part, uh, acti actively takes part in many um, uh, social and global uh, issues. And it organ it, the university held many events um, uh, that are uh, events and conferences um, that are addressing, for example, climate change, uh, pandemic, um, uh, resources shortage, and many, many more. And thanks to that, students have the possibility to come together and uh, engage on those issues. And I really appreciate um, that uh, about this university. And events, I mean, I've been here only for like three months and there have been already many events. So that's uh, quite um, yeah, amazing. Yeah. And um, uh, how does the life uh, on campus looks like? So basically my whole university is a kind of like a small campus, uh, like a small uh, campus town. So uh, on one hand we have our university and also we have our um, buildings, accommodation, and um, some recreational facilities. So uh, it's, uh, it's, really, it's, it's really cool because actually university provides all these facilities free of charge. So we can just book tennis courts, uh, swimming pools, gyms, uh, bowling, squash, or anything you can think of uh, sport-wise. And we can have our uh, nice active life after work or on the weekend. Um, and basically how does the life in Saudi Arabia looks like? So one of my teammates um, here on the picture on the left, uh, her name is Etiar. Uh, she's um, a, a girl from Spain and she had the opportunity to be a team member, a team player in, um, in a football games, uh, which were, um, uh, which was a part of first official women's league um, that was launched by Saudi Arabian Football Federation. Um, uh, last November and uh, we had a chance to be there and cheer her and that's I think one of the most uh, extraordinary time and it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to be part of this monumental event happening in Saudi Arabia uh, because many changes are happening and um, this is just uh, great to be there and experience it. Um, and um, here uh, are some of the pictures um, that I took during my uh, number of travels um, on, that I did on the weekends. Um, for example, here we can see um, an old town of Jeddah, one of the biggest cities in Saudi Arabia, uh, where my university is located one hour um, driving from that city, actually. Um, here we can see um, some old markets, uh, and, and also a campsite um, on the desert um, in a really uh, true Arabic style. Um, and so uh, Saudi Arabia also is not uh, just a desert, it has numerous beautiful landscapes. Um, also many I still haven't discovered because it's really, um, it's a really big country and it involves a lot of time to uh, travel to various places, but so far, what I have seen is, is really beautiful and um, abounding in um, variety. Yeah, and um, and also um, the um, the common thing to do here are uh, safaris on the desert. Uh, here are some pictures from that time. Um, obviously, um, there are red dunes, beautiful sunsets but also really, really, really lovely uh, camels. I was really shocked how sweet they are. Um, and for example, here, the picture in the middle uh, um, where I'm standing on the car, that's a picture that we took, uh, that was taken on a unit day that our um, professor organized. Um, so we had like a team building, which was scientific and fun combination. And um, more or less that was my time in uh, that is my time in Saudi Arabia, and I'm staying here still um, for quite uh, quite some time. So, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, we can't hear you uh, because so, you are yeah. muted. Right, it's always, always happens. So thank you again, Alexandra, uh, for bringing us such a warm presentation. Um, and now we will move on to another warm place. Um, we will hear from uh, Krzysztof. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to connect uh, to you from Panama. Um, I'm a Biodiversity Genomics Fellow at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. We are located mostly in central Panama, so uh, what you see behind me is actually the edge of the Soberania National Park and the Panama Canal is about 200 meters uh, down to my left. So uh, let's just get the screen sharing going. Uh, Okay, um, I assume you can see it okay. So my um, scientific journey abroad has actually started uh, very early or rather it's been abroad uh, the entire time because I left Poland uh, when I was still in high school and I ended up studying um, in the States at Harvard where I quickly discovered that I'm a little bit too lazy or maybe too uh, stupid to, to be a chemist, but I did really like bird watching. And so um, I managed to get a grant to go and do some bird conservation in Costa Rica uh, almost 15 years ago, which uh, really got me uh, into um, evolution and ecology, particularly in the tropics. So after that, I, I followed with doing a PhD in zoology at the University of Cambridge. And from that point on, I have pretty much focused on studying evolution of tropical um, butterflies. And this ultimately led me to the postdoctoral position here in Panama. Right, well, the question is why tropics uh, specifically? I think from the point of view of an evolutionary biologist or, or an ecologist, this is one of the most exciting or the most exciting um, area to work um, in the world because it can serve as this massive outdoor laboratory for evolutionary, for ecological uh, processes. And in particular, the greatest biodiversity on earth is found uh, here in the American um, tropics, which really opens up a whole world of possibilities uh, to ask different questions about how this phenomenal um, diversity that, that surrounds us here really came to be. But at the same time, um, coincidentally with when I was uh, starting my graduate um, studies, evolutionary genetics and genomics has really taken off. It's a very exciting time uh, to be studying biology from a genetics perspective. Um, Alexandra mentioned doing bioinformatics. This is also what I do. Um, I'm primarily interested in studying um, DNA to understand how different organisms uh, speciate, how they appear, how they cope with their environment, so adaptation, how they behave, what are the genetic components to how an organism uh, behaves, makes its decisions, and finally um, using DNA sequencing to study interactions between organisms, so a certain new perspective on ecology. And this is I would think really the best time in, in history to be doing this right now, because we can get genomes, so the entirety of information for practically any organism you can dream of, which gives us an entirely new angle to understand both biology of everything that's around today and how it actually came to be here. So what are the evolutionary processes that generate this splendid diversity? Um, so, after my PhD, I decided to come here to Panama and work at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. And I want to talk about it for a little bit because we are a pretty unusual institution. We are a branch of um, one of the largest and oldest um, scientific societies in uh, scientific institutions in the US, the Smithsonian, but Smithsonian Tropical is the only branch based entirely abroad. We run, um, about a dozen facilities around Panama, which host something like one and a half thousand visitors um, every year. I mean, it's been a little dampened by the pandemic, of course, but we are um, coming back. And so the facilities that we provide allow people from all over the world to come here and study all sorts of aspects of the tropics, and not just biology, but also anthropology, sociology, how we interact with the environment. And we have people working on really anything from coral reef conservation through land use conflicts in the Darien, which is the second largest 
uh, rainforest after, um, after Amazonia uh, to more kind of blue sky science, um, like what I do with, with evolutionary uh, genetics or with microbiomes, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very, it's a very wide uh, platform, which provides a bridge between the global north and Latin America. It allows us to learn from our Latin American partners and to really get a better understanding of, of tropical nature. But at the same time, we bring in the technical platform and a lot of the know-how on how to do cutting edge research. And we've got some pretty advanced laboratories down here, literally on the edge of um, uh, pristine wilderness. So at this point, you might be asking, well, what is it that I actually do? I've been here for five years and how did I use that time? Uh, since the beginning of my PhD, I've been interested in a specific group of butterflies called Hiriconius. And those have been a focus of research for well, pretty much as long as evolutionary biology exists. In 1860s, Henry Walter Bates traveled through Amazonia. And, and one of the things that he noticed, especially were, were these very variable looking um, butterflies. Today, we know that they have a ton of different interesting adaptations, interesting uh, characters, aspects of their, of their biology. They have very variable brains. They have different social behaviors. Um, they have very complex uh, food preferences. And perhaps most noticeably, they show this immense variation in their, in their appearance. So anywhere you go in the neotropics, you will find some species of Heliconius but uh, their patterns can be entirely different. So there's something like 450 different pattern forms throughout the American tropics. It's a very cool system to ask, well, how do you get all this diversity? And what's the point of it? I mean, why, why do you have so many uh, pattern variants? What kind of function do they perform in the wild? And also from the genetics point of view, this is a very neat system to ask how animals can become different. So, okay, you've got 450 patterns, well, how do you make them uh, in, in development through, through genetics, through biochemistry? Um, my project for the last five years has been especially focused on this diversity aspect. I'm looking at two species, which are distributed basically throughout the neotropics in all sorts of different ecosystems, uh, wet forests, dry forests, mountains, uh, rivering sort of areas. And they show this great diversity of patterning across. So this is a system to ask, um, how is the physical environment affecting evolution of an animal? How do different species react to the same pressures? So we, here we have two species which have um, similar but different biology. And so how do they actually, uh, how have they responded over the last few million years to what's been happening around them? And finally, well, they end up looking very, very similar. So what is the kind of evolutionary process that, that drives them to be what they are um, today. When I started this project, we already had pretty extensive collections, but mostly um, reduced to the Andean countries, which are a little easier to work in, especially uh, Colombia, Ecuador, have really good tradition of biodiversity studies. So we had a lot of material from there. But because I'm interested in understanding diversity across the neotropics, um, there were some major gaps. So especially here in, in Amazonia, we had very little uh, information and practically no material for genetics. So uh, working in the field for a few years, I filled in this gap. All these blue stars are places that we, um, that we collected uh, with our collaborators from Colombia, from Venezuela, uh, Peru, and especially Brazil. So something that I'm really proud of in, in this project is establishing these wide connections that allowed us to um, really explore diversity of these butterflies in the tropics, but do it in, in, a, in a way that's, let's say, mutually beneficial or respectful. So not just showing up and, and poaching my samples and leaving to somewhere in Europe or the States to do the research, but actually working here in Panama and in other Latin American countries with local partners involved. Um, just to give you an idea, without going into too many details, the, the, the red lines are essentially roughly the outlines of the transects that we did around the continent to cover uh, various gaps. And I think maybe the highlight of my, of my work in this part of the world has been um, 
a big expedition that we did uh, four years ago in Brazil, starting in Santa Rem, going down through Amazonia, coming out through the dry forest into what is today basically deforest agricultural areas, and then going back into the rainforest all the way into, into Bolivia out uh, west. This took about five weeks. Um, again, classic study system. Apparently, this is what fieldwork looked like in uh, 1860s. It's not quite the same today. Um, the landscapes are still spectacular, but uh, most of your logistics is really making sure that your car can make it across the absolutely atrocious um, Amazonian roads. Um, in our work, we try to collect as much information as possible. So we characterize uh, the local environments. We try to collect DNA, but also chemicals that the butterflies use to attract mates different toxins that they, use them, that they use to defend themselves. So we essentially carry this kind of chemical lab, which occasionally led to, to, to some severe misunderstandings with hotel owners. Um, we had a bit of explaining to do as to what exactly we, we get up to. People typically don't believe you that you came to the middle of the Amazon to, to look for butterflies. Um, but okay, we try to get some, uh, we try to get the locals involved as much as possible, which is one of my favorite aspects of the work. So um, I'm not going to go into the details of the results of this project, but we were actually um, able to fill in all these sampling gaps across the continent and show that the two species have actually evolved in very different ways. So you kind of had this cool discovery that you can have closely related biologically similar species, and yet their evolution is very, very different in face of different environmental pressures. So that's, I think, um, quite a useful insight into how the most diverse place on the planet has evolved. Now, um, unfortunately, this is my swan song as a lepidopterist. Uh, yesterday at midnight, I came back from my last field trip in uh, Panama, in Panamanian mountains. This is probably my last specimen to ever collect. So it's been fun, but uh, just to wrap it up, uh, next month I'm actually moving to slightly more applied science. I'm joining UC Berkeley to work on, uh, on conservation genetics of different animals across California. So if anyone is in the Bay Area, please um, hit me up. And with that, thank you for your attention and it will be fun to chat later. Thank you very much, uh, Krzysztof, for the, uh, for the whole fascinating talk and the pictures. Um, and now we'll, we will move on to uh, a completely different environment and hear from uh, Karol, who will tell us about his journey to uh, Spitsbergen. Karol, whenever you're ready. Okay, give me a second. Is everything fine? Yep. Can you see my uh, cursor? Yes. Okay. Um, so, hello. Uh, thank you for invitation. Uh, before I will tell you something about my expedition to the Arctic, um, I would like to start uh, with a few words about myself. Uh, sorry. Um, so I'm PhD student at the University of Gdańsk. Um, I am studying uh, influence of uh, Atlantification on the um, diversity of Arctic zooplankton. Um, Atlantification, uh, Atlantification is the process uh, connected with um, climate change, um, altering uh, Arctic ecosystem. And uh, zooplankton are small organisms, um, mostly about um, three centimeters at maximum, um, uh, which are drifting uh, in, in, in the water. Um, and I have collected uh, those animals uh, by special uh, nets uh, at station located um, located along uh, um, west coast of Spitsbergen. And uh, then most of my uh, work uh, set place in a lab when I, where I um, identify and uh, counting uh, 
those animals. And before expedition, I had to um, make some preparation. Mm. And that was the one of the most challenging part. Uh, I start about uh, about month uh, before uh, before course, um, uh, and um, I I will tell you something about uh, what I would uh, need for work. So uh, that was for sure uh, some warm clothes and waterproof clothes to to work on deck. And of course, uh, some special equipment to conduct my research um, in this environment. Uh, everything um, had to be packed in excess amount for backup. Uh, and of course, our uh, equipment um, had to be working complete and, uh, and functional. Uh, and what about fit time? Of course. Um, on the ship or on such an expedition, you have uh, plenty of time. Uh, so it's good to take uh, a lot of books to, to fill it, some movies, uh, games, and so on. Mm, and now I tell you about stages of the expedition. Uh, oh, uh, and yes, uh, we start uh, from Gdańsk at the, um, at the board of uh, Oceania, mm, that yacht here uh, you can see here in uh, Hornsund field mm. yacht is the property of uh, institute of oceanology polish academy of science in support mm. and our first uh, our first part uh, take place uh, took place at baltic sea and, uh, and that was the um, calmest part with beautiful uh, sunset, but of course, uh, weather wouldn't last. Uh, good weather wouldn't last forever. So um, at the North Sea, we had a terrible time because mostly because of swaying and uh, sea sickness. Um, for example, I spent uh, most of these days uh, laying uh, and uh, with no ability to move. And um, after that, uh, I have seen my uh, last sunset, uh, my last sunset before um, my last sunset when we reaching um, reaching polar circle, and uh, um, and of course after after this time uh, the polar days began and it's quite amazing amazing to see. Um, to see sun, uh, the sun coming out behind the, the clouds at, at the midnight. And here you can see photo taken around um, 1 a.m. Uh, so it's quite amazing, it's a strange experience. Uh, and also make really hard uh, to, to, feel as, to, uh, to fall asleep. And uh, our first stop was Biernoja, Bear Island, uh, our shelter from wind and storm. Um, despite the name, we haven't seen any bears there, um, but there was everywhere, um, everywhere a bird. Um, and uh, the white spot we can see here, all these, uh, all those white spots are uh, birds. Full mar. And after Bjornoya, we uh, we finally reach Spitsbergen. Uh, the landscape of uh, Spitsbergen, as you can see, is uh, quite harsh but uh, also beautiful. Um, there is no uh, trees, only lichens and uh, other small plants uh, growing in tundra. Uh, and it seems to uh, be that uh, reindeers um, uh, are the most common animals there. Uh, and also um, in Spitsbergen, there is a lot of glaciers, which uh, you can see here. And I have opportunity to um, to see uh, one of them at really close distance, and that was 
Hans Glacier. And uh, I also had chance to uh, see and record uh, glacier calving, and now I uh, try to show you. So that's how it's look. Some part of glacier um, fall apart. Um, it's make uh, a big noise, and that was quite something to see that. Uh, our first uh, our first town we have seen uh, was the, was Longyearbyen, the biggest town of Spitsbergen. Um, here you can see the panorama of Longyearbyen. Um, here is located the uh, the university center in Svalbard, which uh, um, which offers some courses to sign up to sign up for, and um, at the uh, board of the town, uh, you can see uh, si warning sign like like this. Uh, it's of course because of polar bears uh, in Svalbard is prohibited to uh, leave town unarmed. So if you, everywhere in the wild, when you uh, go, you have you have to take uh, with you um, some gun. And the second city was uh, town was Pyramiden. Uh, it's the small. Uh, it is a small uh, Russian mining town, um, abandoned with post-apocalyptic vibe. Uh, here you can see uh, reindeers grazing. Uh, in the middle of uh, in the middle of town, or you can see also building taken by uh, by full mass. Um, and also here we have to uh, uh, whenever we go, we had to um, have gun with us. Someone someone armed. And the last uh, town uh, was New Alessund. Mm. That's the uh, the most uh, northly uh, functioning settlement in the world. Uh, in the city of New Alessund, uh, there are, there are few uh, bird um, birds sanctuary. Um, so it's very important to stay on the stay on the roads uh, whenever you move uh, whenever you move uh, in the town. Um, but it's not uh, save you from attacking uh, attack of um, Arctic uh, Arctic terms. And now I tell you how life on the ships look uh, ship looks like. Mm. So the most challenging uh, is the fact that a ship at sea is pitching most of the time, and here you can see see this. Mm. So each daily activity was a challenge, for example, eating a soup or doing laundry. And also, of course, uh, working. Uh, sw swaying also make um, difficult to work. Mm. Sometimes it creates uh, some dangerous situation. So we always had to be really careful. And uh, we also have to remember to um, Secure all stuff from falling, and we work in watch uh, system. Mm, we formed mainly team of four uh, scientists, uh, one or two biologists, uh, one chemist, and one physicist. And each watch lasts for um, last four hours, mm, and in total, each of us had eight hours of work and 16 hours of free time and for sleep. And in free time, we had um, scheduled and fixed meal times. Um, it was uh, breakfast at uh, 7 a.m., uh, lunch at noon, and uh, dinner at uh, 5, 5 p.m. Um, we also uh, watching movies together um, in our 
meeting room at uh, 8, uh, 8 p.m. Mm. And also we had many opportunities to watch nature and uh, to take to take photo. Um, here you can see um, some of some of them. Um, and quite uh, quite funny was that uh, that some um, some uh, point in menu uh, was uh, really unchangeable. So we measured time with uh, with chicken eaten at uh, eaten at uh, Sunday lunch. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Carol, for sharing with us this unusual place and conditions for work. And uh, we will hear the, the final uh, presentation from the, this part from Isabella. So whenever you're ready. Okay, hello everybody. I hope you can see the screen. Uh, not yet, at least for me. Maybe we need to wait a second. Okay, just, okay. Still nothing. Not yet? No, not yet. Maybe could not you yet. try? Yeah, again. Okay. Okay, something's changing. Yeah, now it's good. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. So hello everybody. Uh, thank you very much for for invitation again from Polonium uh, Foundation. And uh, thank you for organizing this event because well, I'm glad that we can share our experience and I hope to inspire our colleagues with um, uh, to, to explore for their own and uh, to do their own um, research in different parts of the world. Uh, so let's put some tropics in the winter. However, we already had a presentation about um, investigation in, in tropics. So thank you, Christo, for making some kind of to, uh, to what these tropics were so important to investigate and well uh, all right now we'll focus on neotropics and this I call this presentation it's not Benny Vidivici's Vidi story because I had the pleasure to uh, to work in in Venezuela that will be speak now uh, for more uh, more than uh, one decade okay so uh, last time when we connected, I presented you like the, the, the scientific part of my research. And um, if someone wants to see it, I think it's on your YouTube um, place of, of the foundation. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to focus so much on that, uh, on different phases of disturbances, because this is what I would mostly working with. So all my adventures started in 2009, uh, because I, I took a, a course off Tropical ecology uh, in, that was organized by my university uh, in Yagelian uh, University in Krakow and Instituto Venezolano de Investigaciones Científicas, where I'm working right now, and uh, I did my PhD. So it was, of course, a great adventure as and uh, we all fall in love in tropics, and it's nothing really surprising. Because in case of Venezuela, it's 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 a kind of a country that um, where you can find all types of tropical, no tropical ecosystems from Caribbean coast to to glacier, extends lowlands of Los Llanos, uh, high mountains like Andes, Amazon, of course, and the the most ancient um, uh, one of the most ancient. Uh, mountains in the world that are, that are from Precambrian epochs that we call the Puys. So we have there 27 climatic zones, more than 600 types of natural vegetation, 23 uh, different landforms, and uh, 38 large 
biological units. I mean, there's like whatever you want. It's like a paradise for, for biologists, ecologists. So um, this is why uh, a lot of scientists decided to go to, to this um, country in South America to start their, their adventure. And well, talking about adventure is when it started for me in 2000. Um, 11, 2012, when we organized the expedition to one of these tepuis, Tramen Tepui, that has never been explored before, never have been um, climbed. And in my, um, my work there, of course, there was a collection of inste insects, mostly butterflies. As we know, this part of the world uh, it has very high levels of endemism because those um, mountains were separated um, um, thousands of years ago, millions of years ago. So there is actually very high probability that new species of insects, plants, uh, and also mammals are present in these um, places. So this is our expeditions with a lot of adventures and challenges that I have never faced. I was the only woman there. Uh, but I loved all experience here where, for example, taking some samples. Uh, that was just a very little part of all life that we need to face with all very challenging conditions and, um, and life during this kind of um, activities. Uh, because uh, however it was the, uh, the dry season, there was raining all the time because this is the kind of uh, climate that we can find on these mountains. So when it's, there is no rain, there is no water. So without water, we cannot live and we cannot make really an expedition. So it was very, uh, there were very adverse conditions to, to follow the, the collection of materials. Uh, here, mostly guys that they were able to, to climb this rock that is a sandstone, sandstone that is very um, soft and um, it's uh, very dangerous actually to climb there uh, because you can fall with a big block of, of this kind of sandstone easily and it actually happened. Uh, in few occasions. So um, then uh, I had the uh, pleasure to, 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 to find new species there of, of butterflies and, and one frog that was uh, later uh, uh, described. So that was actually the moment that I decided that I want something more. That this, is, this is not enough. Uh, and that was, I, I don't want to finish that only as an adventure. So in 2013, I started my PhD in Instituto Venezolano de Investigaciones Científicas. But um, I started working with big mammals, uh, with jaguars, as you see that these big tracks on the, on the picture before. And um, so I went back. To, to, to Gran Sabana, to this extensive um, land with huge um, mountains, tepuis, to, to, to be uh, again part of that, um, well, adventure, because it, it is making the field work in this kind of uh, area is, is all, uh, all a challenge. Um, there is no infrastructure. It's all, again, um, spending time in, in tents, organizing camp, a very uh, difficult terrain. So I'm working with the equipment that it's camera traps. Uh, it's already right now it's popular in, in the world, but still it's not that popular in, in, in Venezuela. And um, this is the kind of equipment that I'm living in different parts of forest. Uh, and I'm trying to see different uh, mammals, species, big and medium to uh, uh, later calculate different types of interaction with um, deforestation, uh, fire, and, and hunting. Here you already see jaguar and other species that are prey of jaguar. And of course, a species that are people also hunting uh, for. The, the clue, the very important part of the, uh, my collaboration is uh, working with indigenous people. Here you have the, the Pemon group that I was working with. And they have a big knowledge of, of environment, of fauna and flora. But unfortunately, from generation to generation, this knowledge is disappearing. And with a uh, kind of um, education project, I try to keep it alive and all register from camera trap were crucial 
uh, to do so. And they can really see animals around them and know their names in, in language, uh, in Aracuna language, uh, that is also disappearing. So uh, it's, it wasn't only the, the work of biologists, but also the work a bit of anthropogenists, uh, because I needed to um, uh, make a different kind of surveys with, uh, with hunters uh, looking for um, traduction, traduction because there are, uh, in many cases, there's no people who speak Spanish. Of course, I needed to speak Spanish. I need to learn uh, Spanish uh, to make them my PhD there. And uh, here again is this uh, mountain where we, that we climbed. And so later I made uh, my PhD close to this um, spectacular peak. In, in forest and savanna that are around this uh, place. Uh, and uh, that was also the moment when, when I started doing different types of little uh, document, documental movies, uh, because we need to recognize as a scientist that divulgation, it's, it's very, it's crucial to, uh, to show what we are doing uh, as a scientist, what is the important, especially when you are working in conservation. So uh, after uh, my uh, PhD, I did this um, uh, different kind of uh, presentation and expositions with pictures from camera traps in, in Caracas and in different parts of, of Venezuela, and also in, in Poland to make um, to make it visible and um, to show importance of the uh, of science that it's not that obvious in country like Venezuela right now. So, but back to what what changes we needed to to, to make when we move to another country, another continent. Well, we are making a new family. We we need to um, uh, learn language. However, I was told that I can make my PhD in English, but it wasn't true. So I needed to do so and write my PhD in Spanish. I couldn't do it in English, unfortunately. And be prepared that you are a part of good things and bad things. So we need to confront political and economic situation. In my case, uh, I stayed days without electricity and water. Um, I took part in uh, protests and all this part. And that is also, uh, that, that, that have also challenges for society that confronts constant uh, threats. Here you can have the, this souvenirs made by indigenous people, one from 2009 and then in 2018. I mean, in the very same place, you can see the difference, right? What changed in the people's heads and what do we need, unfortunately, what we are confronting. And uh, where I was working, doing my PhD and I'm trying still to work there. It's the, the, the area that are very uh, extensive uh, mining going on. And um, this is like the territory of one third of Poland that are only mining, imagine. And there are different threats, like for example, um, malaria that it's spreading very fast in Venezuela. And there are more cases than in Africa. Uh, so um, this is what uh, we need to be aware. And as we know, there is no uh, vaccine for, for malaria. Uh, other problems like illegal traffic of endangered species. Uh, here you can see the skin of, of jaguar. This is not jaguar meat, fortunately. But uh, there are, uh, you, then in the, in the, uh, I, there in the background, there was actually a station of police that they did absolutely nothing about what is going on in this case. And other logistic challenges that in a country in deep economic crisis can be overwhelming. And of course, very limited financing for science in developing countries that will uh, being there from seeing all situation from the country, not just being the institution in Europe and the United States that you're visiting the country, but you're actually living in this kind of country and are much more um, difficult. But I don't want to, you know, finish that all. It is bittersweet because our life right now is bittersweet. Uh, it is amazing. And I really can, couldn't imagine doing other thing than um, uh, what, I, what I did. I, and, and I keep going to, to Venezuela. I work there. I went back just before Christmas. I'm going again um, very soon. 
So uh, there's something that I would like to end my presentation, which is um, find what I found in Museum of, of uh, American Museum of Natural History. Find your place on the planet, dig in and take responsibility from there. Well, I know that it is not an option for everybody in terms of career development and topics that you are working with. But in some um, cases, uh, in um, when you're working in conservation, you really need to take it on, on account to stay in a place and, and work there. Currently, I'm at the University of Łódź. Uh, that is very focused on studies in tropics. I am still a postdoc in, in Venezuela. So I'm uh, going uh, there uh, between two continents and trying to continue my studies and make it um, visible for, for public. Here are some organizations that helped all this during all these difficult times and they keep uh, helping. Well, thank you very much for your uh, attention and well, right now, uh, just waiting for questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the fascinating story. Um, yes, I, I think you can all see a message from Asha in the chat that we, again, uh, encouraged to sign up for the Polonium Network. And before we start with this, uh, the questions, I just want to uh, say a quick announcement to, um, uh, to the audience that uh, to please let us know how you heard about this event and to fill out the, the feedback form you will get uh, later on. Uh, so uh, we have around 20 minutes for questions. Um, and I think we can kick off with um, uh, with one before maybe someone from the audience um, puts there in the chat. Uh, so my first question would be, um, we've all heard your fascinating and inspiring stories from, from the beginning of your career up until the, um, this interesting uh, place you ended up at. Uh, but how did you find the opportunity uh, to, to move on to your destination, to, to conduct your research abroad? And was it a difficult uh, decision to make? Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to start first or should we just go in a, in a circle? Any volunteers? So maybe we could... Um, well, I, can, I can start, yes. Um, so basically, I was studying my master's degree in Georgia, uh, in Georgia, the country, in Tbilisi, and one of my professors teaching bioinformatics um, um, had collaboration with some Spanish professor who has his own lab in Spain, in Pamplona. And uh, when I was having my um, internship in Switzerland, after my master's degree, I was looking for opportunities of PhD and I figured out that um, I want to pursue PhD in bioinformatics and most of my experience was mainly wet lab based and that's why I contacted my professor from um, my master's degree and one thing led to the other and uh, my the, the professor from Spain was actually moving to Saudi Arabia and I just followed him here and we are doing the internship together and um, that's my story. Thank uh, you. Yes. And, Anyone? Oh. Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it wasn't a difficult decision. Um, I mean, I like adventures and it was exciting. And uh, it will be a difficult decision to stay here for a PhD, um, but for the internship uh, so far is great. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Any, any other thoughts or experiences? from the rest of the speakers. Or maybe I can continue. Um, yeah, I think for me, it was also like a mix of uh, my own plans and ideas and, and things that just happened organically, uh, especially in the beginning, I think I was actually planning each stage and applying for, for things, for funding, for fellowships and so on. And later on, um, it was more a matter of meeting people at conferences and uh, 
having some ideas uh, on common projects and then applying for things kind of spontaneously. So it was really a mixture of um, of yeah of things. But basically, most of most of my uh, moving has been uh, funded by some sort of fellowships or grants. Thank you. Anyone else? I just saw Krzysztof unmuting for a second. Yeah, I mean, I, I would sort of second what Risho just said. I mean, it's up to you uh, when you're at sort of later stages of the career to sort of write it into your grants and such. And I think right now it's it's very much um, seen as an advantage when you're proposing to go to other places and so on. So it can be, uh, it can be arranged, if not even uh, required for some things. But the other thing is just look, look, look. There, there are, I think especially for the sort of things that... Um, that we do in tropical biology when you have to go places uh you know you're always looking for opportunities for 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 field work and for funding that and it's just a matter of scouring the internet over and over and over again but i think a, a, a while ago i was looking for postdoctoral opportunities with with some friends and it's like 300 things that cropped up so it's mostly a matter of just looking a lot Thank you. That's very useful for the for those of us for the, who are still looking for their path. Uh, Isabella or Carol? Well, I think that I already mentioned that the, the my adventure with um, with in, in case of Venezuela, it started with uh, with activity from my uh, alma mater, Aguilonian University, uh, because they organized the course and I, I took part in that. And that was the moment when, when I, I came there for the first time. But of course, the, the question of, of this of decision to start the PhD there, uh, it was um, all my decision actually. Everybody around that was kind of surprised because the, the political situation in the country wasn't the, the best and just got, got worse. So, um, but it's the question of, of decision when, when find something that was actually more curious for me was when I went um, back and uh, I found the, the position in University of, of Łódź. Uh, I was actually looking for biologists doing um, tropical ecology, which is that's not so common in, in Poland. So um, they were actually doing like um, like hunting. So <laughs> this is why I, I get to the university, it, which is um, and it's they still doing that. Um, so maybe this is like a kind of new experience for me that I wasn't that much looking that I was found that I was found. Okay. Thank you, and Carol. Uh, the expedition was was a part of my um, PhD study, um, so I knew it would happen and at some point from the start. Uh, but it was really um, really hard decision to make um, if I want or not want to go uh, on such a trip. Um, mostly because of that, I'm. Basically, it's basically going to unknown. I have no idea what happened to me at, at the ship um, during two months. Um, it was two months uh, without uh, internet, other people. So um, yeah, it's very difficult. But I'm, um, but I'm really happy that I uh, finally. Um, uh, get there and uh, yeah, yeah. Great, thank you. So to sum up, the it was the proactiveness, the perseverance, and I guess a, a tiny bit of luck, right? Um, so we have some questions from the audience. Uh, for one question is from uh, Agnieszka Wojta. Um, and she asks, what are the biggest differences between the scientific cultures in the different countries or universities? Uh, so if anyone wants to pick it up, maybe we can also start with Alexandra or... Right. Well, so actually I have a opportunity to conduct research in Sweden, India, Switzerland, Georgia, and Saudi Arabia, every country is 
totally different. Of course, um, the resources, um, there, there is a big gap in the resources some countries have and some don't have. And it's um, kind of might have an impact of the possibilities that research can be conducted because um, just simply it's not everything is so easy as in other places or not so accessible. So that's quite striking. And for example, when I was doing my master thesis in Georgia, I had to fight a lot for my resources. Do I have to figure out my project myself? There, things were not ready just, just for me. And that was challenging, but also it was a great lesson that um, I'm happy that I had to go through it. Um, so so uh, but, but also in every place, the environment is very, um, the team is very international. So um, uh, this is something that I didn't um, happen to, to meet in Poland. Uh, my, my lab in Poland was purely Polish based. Um, and wh wherever I would go, there would be international team. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, Richard, I, I guess we'll go just by the, the order yeah. of the first question. Yeah, so I mean, as um, Alexandra just mentioned, it, it's usually very international. Uh, so I think the the differences are probably um, there's a lot of differences between people in each country, but I I think the differences between countries maybe are not as strong because of how international it is. Um, but nevertheless, yeah, I did see some kinds of differences. I guess, for example. I don't know, from my experience, uh, some research in Germany is kind of um, quite systematic. It needs to be motivated quite a lot from based on past results. And for example, in the UK, it's much more uh, pragmatic and kind of, I find it more innovative, more creative, uh, but perhaps that's just my experience. Um, and another thing I noticed is, for example, differences between how students approach problems. Um, so I found in the UK, students to be really, very independent and uh, inquisitive and uh, curious. Um, but on the other hand, some students that I worked with in Hong Kong or in mainland China needed much more input from me, much more direction and instruction and kind of step-by-step step-by-step um, uh, uh, step instruction. So that, that was perhaps some difference that I uh, experienced. Thank you, that's very interesting. And uh, Isabella Krzysztof, any thoughts on Southern America? Okay, uh, Isabel, you want to go ahead? Uh, okay, <laughs> well, um, sure. I think there is a different, a big difference in terms of uh, academic culture in, in South America because there is hierarchy. And um, it is something that uh, can be experienced mostly by native people. We are as a, as a, um, Europeans, our life is easier. This is something that I had experienced and I didn't see that it's fair, but this is what is existing. And um, in countries like Colombia or, or Peru, there are a lot of differences. And uh, what you can see is you can go to states and talk with any professor, just you need to ask the question. And there's no, um, no problem with that in, in terms of, um, of how it works academy in, in, in different countries of, of uh, Latin America, uh, it's different, but it's, it's changing thanks to all these kind of um, uh, exchange with, uh, with different countries, with other cultures, it's also changing in Latin America, but you as, as a new person there, you can see the difference. And this, this is my experience and this is what I heard from my colleagues there. Krzysztof, uh, I think that you could have, can have other experience. I, I generally agree. I mean, it's a matter of values. So for instance, in cafeteria, parents and communication, uh, Anglo-Saxon cultures value um, efficiency. That's why, lang that's why English is such a great language for science. And you just, you just go and you say what you need to say. Um, whereas in Latin America, both in, in Spanish and Portuguese speaking cultures, you need to be much more formal, you need to be careful what you say and how you say it to a specific person, because maintaining, like you said, kind of hierarchies, formalities is, is in, in a way just as important as the content. 
So you can just, you know, in English, you basically say, hey, you, professor, I've got this thing. What do you think? You cannot do that in, in, in Spanish and Portuguese. And as a practical consequence, just to give you an example, a lot of my work in Brazil was actually enabled by the fact that I have a collaborator who's uh, basically half English, half British, he can, uh, half English, half, half Brazilian. He kind of grew up there. And so his way of approaching the day-to-day -day, uh, doing of science was very different. And we just hit it off and managed to work much more efficiently because we didn't have to go through that dance of being very formal and you know maybe we can do something just got it done and uh, Carol? Uh, well it's hard to say um, for me because i have no experience with uh, other um, other universities uh, but you have the experience of the of a completely different work environment, the lab versus the ship. Um, yes, of course, uh, it's very uh, different. Uh, it's two completely different environments. Um, again, mostly because of swaying. Um, it's really hard to conduct. Uh, uh, very complicated, uh, delicate um, move to when you have to uh, put your samples to, to the little bottles. Um, all these organisms also little, so it's uh, quite easy to uh, lost a lot of your uh, precious samples when you when you are on the ship. Um, and this that's. That's the most, uh, the biggest um, difference, uh, the stability of the ground. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. Um, we have a few minutes left and a few individual questions. Uh, so uh, there's a question for uh, Krzysztof. Um, uh, Asia is wondering if you could describe the most exotic species of plant or animal which you've seen in uh, Panama for the first time. Um... Okay, here we go. Uh, so I assume you can see my screen. Um, uh, this is a harp eagle. It's the national bird of Panama, uh, second largest uh, eagle in the world. It's about two meters in wingspan and absolutely massive beast. Um, what is interesting about this particular sighting, you can see, it's not a great photo, but you can see at the back there is a building. Um, you normally have to travel about two, three days deep into the east of the country to, to, to maybe get a glimpse of this bird. Uh, we saw one in the middle of the pandemic in Panama City. Uh, no idea where it came from. I mean, Panama City is surrounded by, by, by jungle, so... Well, that's where, but why was it in the middle of the city is a bit unclear. It wasn't a release individual. It didn't have a band, never been recorded or studied. Perhaps an example of just how quickly wildlife was coming back when there was decreased human activity uh, during the pandemic. So that's by far my, my coolest sighting in the Neotropics because it was just so unusual to see this animal in, in the man-made um, context. Um, so I think that, yeah, that's my highlight. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Uh, there was also a question to Richard um, from, from Anja Stre, Strekalovskaya, sorry uh, for my pronunciation. Um, would you say, is it necessary to move as much as you have in order to find your place and get the best overview of your field? Or would it be sufficient to have one university per level of education? Yeah, I don't think there's a rule. I don't, definitely don't think it's necessary to move as much. Uh, it's partly my preference, partly, um, yeah, I mean, as uh, also, uh, there was another question in the chat by uh, Maya uh, about family life and so on. So, you know, not all of my moves were only for work, right? I also made some um, decisions based on kind of personal uh, factors, relationships and so on. And sometimes it was a bit of a compromise um, um, that I had to uh, find between work and um, and relationships, for example. So um, yeah, I don't think it's necessary to move as much. Um, 
But uh, I do think it's good to experience another way of doing uh, work in your field and um, to learn different ways of uh, doing research. And especially if you're planning a career in academia, I think that's really good to, uh, to know how people can approach similar problems with many different uh, methods. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for your answer. Uh, we have quite a few questions in the chat and the, the meeting will be finishing soon. Uh, let me just uh, do a very quick summary um, and then we can maybe ask the remaining questions if we have a few minutes left. Um, so let me quickly share my screen. Um, because I would like to tell you all that we're, we're taking a, a little hiatus with uh, the Career Cafe in February and we will be back in March. Uh, so please stay tuned and if you like this meeting, uh, watch the space or rather our social media spaces for updates. And um, if you have signed up for a newsletter or um, information list, we will definitely get in touch with you uh, to inform you about the the next meeting. Um, and I will very quickly like to thank everyone who was involved in organizing um, uh, today's event for their hard work and uh, the time they've invested into putting it all together. Um, and please remember to uh, fill out our feedback form uh, when we send it to you, obviously. Okay. Uh, so, Quickly back to the questions. We can, I think, we can still ask one or or two. There was one about um, dealing with the the loneliness for uh, from Magdalena. I don't know if it was specifically for Carol and his um, his ship experience or for uh, for each of you moving into a completely new environment. But uh, I guess we can uh, start with Carol. Mm, okay. So. Uh... It's not as hard uh, as could be um, because of uh, of that that we have a chance to send and receive emails um, from our friends uh, and the loved ones. Uh, so it's not uh, so uh, so difficult, so much difficult, um, and also. Uh, the vicinity of Svalbard, there was some uh, spots with um, uh, with um, possibility to to connect with, um, let's say, other world, outward, um, to to make a call. Uh, so we always waiting for that time and. Uh, Everyone uh, goes uh, go on the on the deck to always. Uh, it was always to hard find some spot to to talk privately. But uh, it was manageable. Great, it's great to know for all the future adventures. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else would like to share some? loneliness or coping with loneliness stories before we finish? Perhaps Isabella could speak a little bit about being the only female on the uh, expedition in the jungle. <laughs> this is actually very curious because I didn't notice that, but then journalists ask me, how did you manage that to be the only woman there? And like, oh, really, that's what's true. But that doesn't didn't really matter in the moment. Everybody was cooking. Everybody was doing all the um, the stuff. There's like no um, division, of nothing like that. So <laughs> I think that um, in terms of loneliness, uh, I could speak for myself in in what I um, in terms of my experience in Venezuela, because I spent there like seven years continuously uh, with short. Um, Short, short visit in, in Europe and uh, this is what I actually said that you, you need to make the new family there, new friends there, become your family but um, I think in the question it 
if this is the, the short term stay, um, it's, it's so difficult to make a new family. Um, so just be open and try to use all these kind of uh, digital possibilities that we have right now and to look for um, in, in these places, of course. The, the first thing is to have this space in your head and then just open Facebook and look for people in, this, in, the, in the city that you are in and connect and other applications. Thank you. What you can... What kind of experience experience you can get there? Thank you very much for the answer. Uh, maybe uh, for the last few uh, seconds or for the last minute, Alexandra could pick it up because uh, you're in Saudi Arabia only for a, for a short internship. So how did you manage uh, with, mm -hmm. with your move? Uh, well, so as I mentioned, my professor originally um, had a lab in Spain and, and he's moving it uh, here. So he had a few visiting students uh, from Spain that all of them were kind of new and lonely. <laughs> so we gathered together and we could uh, spend time together. However, now after Christmas uh, break, um, I'm the only one back. So I will figure out um, how to deal with it in upcoming weeks. But uh, it's an international community here. So we have many activities. So I, I trust myself. Uh, but I will make a new friends. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you. And Krzysztof, uh, would you like to share your experiences from, from moving? I mean, frankly, I, I like my career, but let's be honest, this is the aspect of it, for me at least, that sucks the most. And, and everywhere I've, I've moved, so I've, I've sort of stay a few years in, in one place at a time, people complain about the same thing, the transitory environments. So you come, you make some friends, half of them leave within a year or two, and, and so it goes. And that's kind of the property of like any major university, um, especially now that we have this kind of mobility as an, as an enforced uh, requirement. And uh, I struggle with it. I mean, I've, you know, I'm 30, whatever, don't have a family, don't have any kind of permanence. I know I'm one of many, many, many people like this at the sort of postdoctoral uh, level. And I can't honestly say that I deal with it very well. I think I deal with it by, by workaholism. And I think, and I say, and I talk about it so frankly, because I think it's really important to keep in mind um, that if you want a scientific career, uh, there is a serious uh, risk of, of, of having to, to, to deal with these problems. It's, it's just very, very unstable. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you all for your, uh, your detailed and, and honest answers. And thank you to all the participants. Um, I think this is this is it for us for the meeting.